Let's take a song and distort it. If we commit that by bouncing it down and then dragging the bounce back into our DAW, we can see that that distortion is there forever. We've done the damage, it's distorted, and we can never undo that distortion. But wait a minute, what was that other button on my plugin? The reverse button. That's right, I can completely undo the distortion and now it's as clean as a whistle again. And just for some extra proof, I can phase cancel that with the original and demonstrate that it's identical to the original. We've completely undone the distortion. Why is this? Am I lying to you? Is this a prank? No, not at all. You can download that plugin from my website and just try it out for yourself. The left side is the saturation side, and that is just a hyperbolic tangent saturation distortion. And on the right side is the reverser side, and that's an arc hyperbolic tangent function, which is just the inverse. So what is this magic trick then? Well, the distortion that we were just using is a fairly good digital representation of something like analog tube saturation. And although it looked like it was clipping, that it was pinned to 0 dB, it wasn't. We didn't clip at all. There is zero clipping happening there in that distortion example. And how can I be so confident? Well, with my distortion reverser plugin, it fails to reverse properly when it clips because information loss happens and you can't reverse information loss. So anytime you actually do clip, you hear really nasty distortion and I can show that to you now. So you hear those nasty crackles? That's what happens when we push the saturation too far and we do get clipping. And when we get clipping, we get information loss and the reverser can't undo information loss. It's simply the data is gone and we can't get that back. So clipping is digital information loss. And we can look at this in more detail on a whiteboard. So the saturation algorithm in my plugin is a hyperbolic tangent. What does that do? It takes the sine wave, which we see on the left and pushes up the samples to compress them into a smaller range on the right. So we can see that visually, that should make sense. It's quite intuitive just looking at the diagram, the arrows push it up and compress it. As a result, we can hear distortion, but what we're doing is remapping the values numerically. It's a mathematical function. So if we map it one way, we can also map it back. It's a bi-directional process. We can map it there with a hyperbolic tangent and we can map it back with an arc hyperbolic tangent. So given that you've got adequate precision, at least 24 bit, or you can get it back. There's no data loss happening at all. There's zero data loss. But not only is there no data loss, the fidelity of the original signal is still there. It's just compressed, but you've got all of the details of the waveform still in the waveform. We've not got rid of the details at all. But now let's have a look at digital clipping. With digital clipping, there's no remapping of the values. The values above the threshold are simply lost. And because now all of those values are identical, you can't map back because it's all the same thing. So you don't know what was what. So there's no remapping. You can't go in the other way. You can only go one way. It's destructive, final. Never get that back if you commit it and don't keep the original copy because you've just lost the data. At this point, I'm hoping that many of the people who were critical of my original video come around to the idea that using saturation is better than using straight digital clipping as it achieves the same kind of result without the literal information loss. So the clipping devaltees say, okay, it's information loss, but it's only one or two samples. And in the broad scheme of things, one or two samples doesn't really matter, but they can really take a load off the limiter. So it's actually worth it. And it doesn't cause that much information loss as you might make out in this video. Well, if it was only one or two samples, that would be completely fine. I agree that would be fine, but let's look at how many samples it actually is under realistic conditions. 
So here's the kick drum mic of a drum recording. The first thing you'll notice is that the peaks are all of different amplitudes. So over the course of the song, you can see at the end there, the kick drum is being played louder than it is at the start. So this means if you wanna use clipping in the way that some people online advocate and hit everything just a couple of dB, above the peak we're well, then you're going to have to go through and automate every single beat and that's just ridiculous no one's ever going to do that and with electronic music if you've got any feel in your music whatsoever and it's not this completely static single quantized samples then more likely than not the way that you produce that feel is going to be pre-effects and not after your effects chain so then you're subject to a similar problem but all of that aside let's just arbitrarily turn up the gain until we reach the top of some of the quieter transients we zoom in and we look at one of the kick drums and look at the information loss that's happened. It's actually way more than one or two samples. If we zoom right in, we can see that's, that's a lot of samples there. It's like a hundred samples or something. So that's the result of clipping on the raw unprocessed recording. But more people might be interested in what happens after processing. For example, on a snare, we want to compress the snare in a real heavy way, which is going to cause a really big transient. And now we want to cut off that transient so that it doesn't trigger our limiter. So my opinion aside, let's do exactly that. A heavily compressed top snare mic going into a clipper. That's the ideal use case for a clipper that many people advocate. So as you can see, there's pretty heavy compression going on there and we can use a clipper and we can use my saturation plugin and boost them both up the same amount and bounce them out and see what happens. So this one here is the digital clipping. As you can see, there's this pure information loss. Whereas on the saturation version, we can still see the details in the snare drum and the same there on the negative portion, we see that the information loss has occurred with clipping, but not with the saturation. We might think, but what happens after a reconstructive filter? Maybe some of that clipping is reversed. We can use Fab Filter here and put a low pass filter on at 16K, so quite low here. So if there was any effect, we'd see it with this and bounce it out. And as you can see, we still have a whole bunch of clipping. We can even turn down Fab Filter a bit just to make sure we're not introducing more clipping with that process and bounce it out again. But no, as you can see, this lower one is the clip version. It's this information loss and the saturation one still has the information there. People who so adamantly use clippers in their mixes are focused on making their music loud. Not necessarily good, just loud. But their efforts ironically result in a quieter, more feeble sound than had they not used clippers in the first place. Let's look at a bit of an extreme example clipping the master bus. So I've boosted this track 20 dB into digital clipping and obviously the result is massive clipping there. So this is very loud, very distorted, very clipped. Now radio stations have all pass filters in their output chains and there's many situations where your music might be put through an all pass filter. And even if it doesn't explicitly go through an all pass filter, there's many situations in which phase rotation might occur. So what happens to that loudness? We've heavily clipped it so it's ruler flat on the top. Once we've phase rotated it, what happens? Well, there's a clue there. The output fader is on minus 10. So let's listen back with the volume dropped 10 dB. As you can see, the phase rotation completely messed up the hard limit set by that clipping. And now we've got a whole bunch of transient peaks popping out left, right and center. And we have to turn the whole thing down 10 dB to reach approximate normalized level. Let's bounce it out once more and see what the waveform now looks like post all pass filtering. Well, would you look at that? It looks like it's never been clipped in the first place and there's all sorts of spikes in it and it just doesn't look like it's been clipped at all. And now what we thought was really loud is actually not really that loud at all once it's been passed through any sort of phase rotation processing whatsoever. And like I say, radio, all sorts of broadcasting, car hi fires, we're talking vinyl. So unless your target audience is literally people just downloading the files from Bandcamp and playing that on their MP3 player and never touching the volume knob, then it's completely nonsensical and doesn't win you any points at all. 
Now I anticipate comments like, I clip all of my mixes and my tunes get played at big festivals on huge sound systems and there's no problems at all. Well, if we look at Ethan Weiner's book, The Audio Expert, we can see that he writes, sustained high power is the main enemy that kills a driver by overheating its core. This either melts the pieces together or melts the insulation and he goes on to say how it can mess up the speaker in various different ways. And what is sustained high power? It's any sustained voltage. What does sustained voltage mean? Squared. So clipping is squared off. So heavily clipped signals produces sustained higher power on the positive and negative portions. And this builds up as heat in the voice coils and burns out the speakers. But then you might say, okay, well, Ethan Weiner might not have the cutting edge up-to-date technology. So let's look at what ElectroVoice say they're a leading manufacturer of PA systems. So on this particular amplifier which they manufacture, they have a comparator circuit built in which detects clipping and then severely limits the output to protect their speakers. But despite that, if we look at ElectroVoice's PA Bible, they explicitly say that clipping, and here they're talking about amplifier clipping, but it applies to any type of square topping of a wave. It says that the distortion overpowers the tweeters and mid-range speakers and results in smoke and no sound. So if you don't blow up the speakers and are lucky enough to have the protection circuit built in, then you're just gonna get severely limited and your volume turned down by the PA system automatically in the amps. You might be thinking, well, ElectroVoice are a leading manufacturer, but maybe they're not the best manufacturer. Maybe Mayer Sound are a better manufacturer and make better speakers that don't overheat. Well, here's their Panther range, which is an over-engineered flagship range of high-end PA speakers for huge, massive festivals. And what do they say in their manual? When the protective limiter kicks in, distortion increases due to clipping and non-linear driver operation and the drivers are subjected to excessive heat and excursion which compromises their lifespan and may eventually damage them. And some people might be grumbling that it's mostly been talking about power amplifier clipping so far and not really clip signals themselves like the music itself or from the Mackie website any clip signal can potentially damage the speaker and it doesn't matter whether it's a mixer, amplifier or any other piece of audio equipment. It's the mere fact that you've got sustained power which overheats the voice coil. Next up, let's listen to an actual audio example of how clipping actually makes stuff weaker. We can use clipping to start turning this snare up to get it loud. Let's say we think that's an acceptable point to clip it. And if we compare it with the original, of course it's way, way louder than this original. It sounds bigger and fuller, more powerful. But now here comes reality. Let's bounce it out using Luff's normalization and bounce the original out using the same Luff's normalization value. So here's the clipped version. Sounds okay, I guess, but let's compare it with the original. Wow, massive difference. Huge transient on the original. Sounds great and powerful. The clip version sounds weak and feeble in comparison. So you might complain, well the normalization turned it down. If you just didn't turn it down, then it would be louder. Trivially yes, but practically no. Wrong. Why? Because you aren't in charge of the listener's volume knob. If YouTube or Spotify or whatever other streaming service doesn't turn it up or down, the listener will. That's why hi fires have volume knobs, and DJ mixers have gain pots. The listener is in control of their volume knob and you as a mixing engineer are not. It's such an obvious fact, but so many people in the audio world forget that once music is released, the playback level is unenforceable. Let's take a typical use case. You're listening with Alexa through Spotify. Well, Spotify is gonna do some automatic gain compensation, but even if you've turned that off in the settings, you've still got the possibility to tell Alexa, turn it up or turn it down. If you're listening on a turntable, well, the differences between singles and LPs and even different LPs is so big, you're always gonna be adjusting the gain knob to get the right playback level. And if you're listening on an iPhone with headphones, You've got the volume control right there. It's so quick and easy to adjust the volume that there's no reason to think that the user is just gonna be subjected to a fixed listening volume. That's a bizarre thing to assume. Once we understand this, we also need to understand that louder and quieter are of relative terms. Louder compared to what? We need a reference point. And if that reference point is some unknown variable, such as the user's volume knob, which we have no knowledge or control over, then we're not entitled to use the words louder or quieter at all in relation to the playback volume. So if we want to say we make a loud mix with clippers, no, you don't. Relative to what? You don't know how loud it's going to be played back. So you ha you're not entitled to use those terms at all. 
Of course, if someone comes across your music on a site which doesn't have loudness normalization and it's super quiet, then the listener might think there's something wrong with it. But when we're talking about using clippers to get louder mixes, we're generally speaking about a difference of one or two dB, something like this. It's a very small difference if you know how to mix loud without clippers and then you mix with clippers, the difference really isn't that big. And anyway, there are other different psychoacoustic effects which you can use to get really loud sounding results without using clippers at all. So if you know how to mix well versus a mix with clippers, you might actually be able to mix louder without clippers versus someone who's using clippers and doesn't know how to mix well loudly. Hopefully now you're coming around to the idea that digital clipping is actually a bit lame and if we want that kind of effect, we could probably do it better with saturation, at least in a less destructive way, like the plugin which I made for this video and you can just download that plugin completely free. It's just compressing at the, the extremes, just like analog tape or a tube amplifier or something like that versus this pure information loss with the digital clipping. So unless you want to bite the bullet and say information loss, that's great. Selectively deleting my music, I love it. Unless you want to do that, most people are now going to start to move the goalposts and shift the conversation into soft clipping. So soft clipping, people use it because they say clipping, that's just clipping it directly at the threshold. If sample bigger than threshold, sample equals threshold, just hard clipping it. But with soft clipping, we're sort of rounding it off a bit before we get to the threshold. But what do you think we've been doing so far with my saturation plugin? It's been doing exactly that. You can't exceed zero dB with the saturation plugin, which I've made for this video. Why? Because it uses a hyperbolic tangent function and a hyperbolic tangent outputs a value between minus one and one. So think of any number, any number at all, even a really, really big number, like, I don't know, quadrillion, whatever. It won't be more than one because it's impossible. It can't output a number bigger than one or smaller than minus one. It is, it, there's a hard defined limits. There you go, hard defined limits with the smooth transition to that. So that is the saturation. That's always been the saturation. And you think, okay, but analog doesn't work like that. Well, if you've got an analog tube amp, for example, of course there's a hard limit at some point, otherwise you could just get like a tiny one watt tube amplifier and play Wembley Stadium with it without any PA or something. Of course there's a hard limit. The hard limit is the output of the amplifier, that's what saturation is. But now some people might argue, forget about the digital domain, we're talking about analog. The way the clipping happens in the analog domain is soft and round and smooth. Okay then, well let's just get out my favourite audio electronics textbook. This is Small Signal Audio Design by Douglas Self and he's actually got an entire section dedicated to this exact topic. He starts off by saying that clipping sounds bad and we normally want to avoid it. However, you can use it in radio because if we exceed certain levels we might even run into legal problems and in fact in the radio industry clipping has been used for a very long time and he says you can also find a use for it in amplifiers but he lays down four requirements for clipping number one it should be symmetrical without a time component number two the top of the waveform should be absolutely flat number three you must be able to set a threshold and number four the clipper can't be active below the threshold so he's defining it as an electronic clamp he then specifically mentions softness in clipping and says that if it's soft it's not proper clipping although douglas self doesn't seem to reject the term soft clipping he makes it obvious in his book that a well-designed clipping circuit has a flat top just like digital clipping so in summary don't focus on loud focus on good and if you didn't see the video which sparked the controversy on soft clipping check it out here